Today I want to introduce a powerful ministry that I just simply want to call the Ministry of Presence. Now this takes place when you show up in the life of of someone who's suffering or discouraged. You You don't show up to give that person your favorite verse, you know, a little pep talk. No, you show up and listen and serve them. You you communicate love and support. By the way, you don't have to be trained uh, for this ministry. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to, you know, have a resume of experience. You, you just show up. And I want to watch it with you take place here in the life of Job. Now, in chapter 2 and verse 11, we're introduced to three of Job's friends. We, we call them three counselors. And let me just say, in chapter 2, they get it right. It, it all goes wrong as soon as they start talking. We'll get to that later. But for now, we read here in verse 11, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite. They made an appointment, that is a pact, an agreement, together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. Now, Eliphaz is mentioned first, more than likely because he's the oldest. In each of these cycles of speeches made by these three friends later on in the book, Eliphaz always speaks first. He alludes to himself over in chapter 15 as a gray-haired man. In fact, he says he's older than Job's father. So, Eliphaz, more than likely, is at least 75 years of age. His name means God is fine gold. He was likely a wealthy, influential leader in his hometown there in southern Arabia. Now, the next man mentioned to us here in verse 11 is Bildad, the Shuite. Bildad doesn't show up anywhere else in the Bible. He's from Shua, a region named after Abraham's youngest son, by his second wife, Keturah, over in Genesis chapter 25. It's quite possible that Bildad and Abraham's son, Shua, knew each other. And and if so, Bildad may may have benefited from the wisdom of Abraham's youngest son. What we do know is that Bildad was a friend of Job. And frankly, that, that alone speaks highly of him. The third and final friend mentioned here is Zophar, the Naamathite. He's always the last to speak, and therefore, according to this culture and custom, he would have been the youngest of the three. He's from Naam. That's a region, more than likely, between modern-day Beirut and Damascus. Well, these three friends have heard the devastating news concerning Job and all that he's lost. It took some time for them to get that news. It took them some time to to get together, to correspond back and forth. It took some time where they eventually agreed to travel together to encourage Job. One author said that if you have one friend who will drop everything and come running to you in your time of need, that's wonderful. To have three friends like that, well, that's amazing. Well, we have no idea how long it took to make this trip. It could have been six months before they arrived, or even longer because of the communication back and forth until the time they agreed to begin traveling together. And when they do arrive, though, somebody evidently points them toward the town dump where Job is now living among the ashes. We read here in verse 12, when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. The Hebrew text informs us that they are literally wailing in grief and shock. Verse 12 also tells us they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. Now, tearing the robe from the neck downward toward the heart was the customary way of expressing that your heart was torn or broken. 
Since Job is filthy here at the town dump, they basically join him by soiling their own hair and clothing with dust. And now we're told here in verse 13, they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Let me tell you, beloved, this is, this is a powerful ministry of presence. And these three friends get it right. They get it right. And they're responding without saying a word, really, in three different ways. First, they're identifying with Job in his physical condition. I mean, if Job is sitting here, you know, on the ashes of burned garbage at the town dump, well, they're going to sit down with him. They'll just ignore all the townspeople out there who've probably come out to stare at him. Earlier in verse 11, we're told that they had come to, to sympathize with him. That Hebrew verb, to sympathize, means to, to show him sympathy. It, it means more than, you know, a quick hug. It, it means literally to rock the body back and forth as you shake your head. You know what? Those are signs of grief. You might do that today when you hear the news of, of someone's 39 seconds of unexpected suffering. All you can do is kind of cover your mouth and, and shake your head back and forth and just sort of rock your body, and you're just stunned. You're, you're in silence and joining them in their sorrow. That's what they do here with Job. You know what this means? This means Job is no longer crying alone. He's got these three grown men out here at the town dump crying with him. They're weeping and they're wailing over all of his tragic losses. By the way, have you ever been to the town dump where you live? Have you ever driven out to a landfill to drop off a truckload of trash? I have. It takes your breath away. The smell of rotting garbage, the screeching of all those birds overhead fighting for food, it, it, it kind of makes you, you want to drive away after about, you know, seven minutes. Imagine being out there for seven hours. How about for seven days? Verse 13 says, they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. See, they're identifying with him physically. Now, secondly, they join Job in his time of sorrow and grief. You need to understand that seven days and seven nights was the customary length of the time for mourning the dead. So they're just sort of holding an impromptu memorial service uh, for Job as they remember the loss of his 10 children. See, they're not asking Job to cut his sorrow short. They're joining him in this time of of grief. Have you ever noticed the fact that no one is ever invited to a funeral? Invitations are never mailed out. Word just spreads and and friends just show up. And and if they can't, they're going to send flowers or notes or cards to communicate to the sufferer, hey, I want you to count me in. I'm there with you all the way. That's what they do here for Job. Third, they allowed Job the opportunity to speak first. Now, don't miss this. Underline this in your mind. (laughs) They're going to allow Job to be the first to speak. I I don't know about you, but but when I show up at the bedside or a home or a hospital room of someone suffering, I'm tempted to break the silence here fairly quickly. I've got to come up with something to say. Don't do that. We don't need to say anything profound or wise. Remember, these friends are getting it right here by remaining quiet. Those who offer the ministry of presence don't show up to talk. They they show up first to watch and, and, and to weep, to sympathize, to listen. This is a good reminder, beloved. That the Bible isn't to be used like a Band-Aid, you know, as if we can just stick some favorite verse on somebody's grieving heart and, you know, make it feel all better. Scripture is, is not an aspirin. Here, take these two verses and call me in the morning when you're feeling better. No. Physical injuries take time to heal. We need to understand that internal injuries of the heart 
take time to heal as well. And if you haven't learned it by now, learn it here at this scene. You don't eliminate someone's sorrow. You share it. I remember reading some time ago of a pastor and his wife who went through a a painful time after the loss of of, uh, their 18-year-old son who died in an accident. And he, he later talked about his experience in grief, and he said, you know, I was torn by, by grief. He said uh, people would come to visit. He said, I can remember somebody coming that I knew well talking to me about God's dealings of, you know, why this happened, of, of you know, the hope that I had beyond the grave. And <laughs> he talked constantly, and he said things that were true. This pastor said, but I was unmoved, except I I wished he would go away, and he finally did. But then he said another uh, believer came and and sat beside me for an hour or more and and listened whenever I said something, answered fairly briefly, prayed simply, and and left. And the pastor said, I I was moved and, and comforted, and I hated to see him go. Beloved, let's offer to others that kind of comfort. This is is a profound ministry, what we could call the ministry of presence. Well, until we set sail on our next wisdom journey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.